Everything is set and ready for our third drama under the direction of Brother L. O. Jones, a elder of the Houston Sunnyside Congregation. Please be reminded that no one is to come down to or near the stage. And be very careful not to block anyone's view in any way, especially to take pictures. Remembering our Christian manners, all may enjoy the presentation of the drama, The Zeal for Your House Will Eat Me Up, Brother Jones. One of the first acts that Jesus performed in his ministry was the driving of the traders and money changes out of the temple in Jerusalem. Charging them with making his father's house a house of merchandise. Because of his intense feeling and concern for Jehovah's house of worship, his disciples called to mind what was written in the Psalm of David. The zeal for your house will eat me up. This zeal that characterized Jesus' beginning ministry never faded. Instead, it intensified as the days of his ministry began to multiply. And as the pace of his ministry began to accelerate, When this happened, and this is what we want to keep in mind. This zeal that Jesus had was the kind of zeal that we want to manifest. This zeal that Jesus had set an example for us. Is this the kind of zeal that you magnify? It is in use by many of our brothers who have given of themselves many of their years, their youth, their vigor, and their strength. Let us then notice how these brothers can help us. As they gave of themselves with joy in their hearts and thankfulness to God on their lips, they continued to say, let us then listen to one such sister. Let's call her Sister Joy. And as she speaks to us in the presence of a young couple in her congregation, let us ask this question. Do I have the zeal that is for Jehovah's house that is truly eating me up? And here she comes now with Jack and Laura. Let's watch and listen. You worked for me on the, the last call. Jack, but that woman was so interested. I just couldn't leave without giving her something to think about till I got back next Thursday. She said she was going to be home, so I want to be sure to be there. Oh, that's fine, Sister Joy. And I'm glad you could stop off at our place for a while before we go down to the Kingdom Hall. I can't understand how you keep going the way you do. You never seem to stop. <laughs> oh, oh, I do get tired once in a while. But I love the service. I, I can't do as much as I used to, but I try to rest every chance I get. <sighs> oh, that's good. 
But there's nothing like the joy of the service to keep you going. How long have you been in the truth now, Sister Joy? Well, let's see. Um, it must be close to 50 years now. Let's see, I was 22 when I was baptized. But look, I'll be telling you my age in a minute. Oh, well, never mind. Age doesn't seem to mean so much to me as when I was a young girl. I guess the older you get, the less important things like that seem. But don't you ever really get tired? Don't you feel like um, slowing down sometimes, Sister Joy? Well, yes, I, I, I get tired, it's true. But it seems like whenever I do, something comes along to make me forget it. I guess that must have been the way it was with Jesus. It was? Well, do you remember when he was on his way up into Galilee from Jerusalem, near the beginning of his ministry... Oh, what happened? He was going through Samaria, and he stopped by the well, Joseph's well, that is, mm -hmm. near Sica, and he was tired. So he sat down by the well while his disciples went into town to get something to eat. I remember that. Well, when he was there, a woman came along, a woman from Samaria. And even though he was a Jew, he started giving her an informal witness. Well, she got so excited that she literally ran into town to tell everybody about it. Oh. Well, then, when his disciples came back and offered him food, he said he'd already eaten. Huh? Well, the disciples couldn't understand that either. Uh-huh. But then he said, My food is for me to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Oh, yes. I often think of those concluding words of his, to finish his work. I it was that, that zeal for God's service that kept him going. And it must have looked like he'd been refreshed, too, because his disciples really thought he had eaten something. Isn't that interesting? I remember reading that. But I don't know whether I could do that. I know I enjoy this service. I've never been happier since I got the truth. But of course, being new at it, I guess I don't realize what it means. I guess it's just love for people, isn't it? Yes, love of God and love of neighbor. Mm. I often think of what the Bible says about Jesus and how he felt great compassion for people. He saw them as skinned and knocked about, as sheep without a shepherd, and his heart went out to them. I know what you mean. I, I feel that way, too, when I see some of these poor people and the way they've been misled by their clergy. Well, it just makes my heart go out to them. And I remember, too, Mark told about a leper who came up to Jesus, entreating him on bended knee. And, and he said, Master, if you just want to, you can make me clean. And Jesus moved with such pity, he stretched out his hand and said to him, I want to Isn't that be wonderful? made wow. clean. What, what compassion he had. I know I never have to think about myself or my problems when I'm out in the service. I just forget those things. Isn't that so? And the inconveniences, the discomforts, they just don't seem to mean anything anymore. I, I know I'm not as strong as I used to be, and I'm, I'm not able to do as much as I used to, but the longer I'm in the truth, and the worse this old system gets, the more I feel the need for the work, and the more I enjoy being out there and helping those people. That's really wonderful. But can't you do other forms of the ministry sometimes? Something that isn't so strenuous as going from door to door and calling back on the people the way you do. Yes, like maybe visiting the sick or something like that. Oh, I do, Laura. I, I do get to see those who are sick. In fact, I see Sister Shot in every Tuesday and every Thursday and Saturday on the way home from service, and we have a oh, fine time nice. together. Right now, we're reading the new book. Oh, that's a good idea. And she just loves it. You know, it's even helping me because she has some very good questions sometimes, and that makes me think. But just the same, I don't think I could survive without the preaching work. I can believe that. <laughs> so as long as Jehovah allows the way to stay open, and he gives me the strength to do it, as long as it's his will for me, 
I want to be out there going from door to door and talking to the people. That's certainly a commendable way to feel. And you know, Sister Joy, you're an inspiration to everybody in the congregation. Oh, Your example has meant a lot to us, too, Sister Joy. Well, I don't know about that, Jack, but, but really, I do think most of our brothers feel the way I do about it. I guess so. You know, when you see all those people who are still part of Babylon the Great, and so many of them seem to have honest hearts. In fact, every year thousands are coming into the truth. Well, how can we slow down now when the end is so close? It just just seems to give you more zeal to go ahead and, and do more, really. But Sister Joy, that's something I've always wondered about. Hasn't that been the feeling for for a long time? Haven't the brothers said for many years that the end is very close? Well, yes, yes, that's true, Jack, they have. And Brother Joy and I always worked as though the end were very, very close. No, that's just what I mean. But uh, I'm not disappointed that it hasn't come yet. Brother Joy has been dead about ten years now, but I still prefer to lean upon the understanding of Jehovah's organization. And... You know, the Watchtower is always encouraging us to keep going stronger and stronger all the time. Just because it didn't come earlier than we thought it might doesn't mean that it isn't going to come. I know. You know, as Brother Joy used to say, I can still hear him saying it. If we're doing what's right, going from door to door, that is, then why should we do less just because some think that the end is still a long way off? Now, that's true, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's the, it's, the, it's the preaching that's important. Our joy is in helping to save people's lives, not just getting through Armageddon by the skin of our teeth. <laughs> Jesus' work was twofold, just like Jeremiah's. Do you remember the watchtower we had some years ago? Mm. No, I don't think you would remember that. It was before your time. But I remember, just like it was yesterday, down with the old and up with the new. My, that was thrilling. Well, it sounds like it. And uh, just like that, Jesus hated and exposed God's enemies because he loved God. He was, he was merciful, and he tried to help them at first, but they wouldn't listen, so he had to expose them. But he also preached salvation to those who were meek and humble, and Jesus never tired out. He always kept going, and the work he did kept increasing right down to the very last. He never let up. He never got so tired that he stopped working. And when we think of all the things he had to go through, my, what an example he set for us. Mm, no the one perfect ever liked example. Him. Well, uh, with an example like that, then why should we be thinking of satisfying our heart's desire or making things easy for ourselves? He didn't even have a home to call his own. He had the clothes on his back, and he went all over the land giving to others everything God had given to him, using his power of healing and giving him the word of life. The joy that he had could never be measured by anything this world could have offered him or could offer us either. Sister Joy, could you tell us some of the events of Jesus' ministry that you remember that have been encouraging to you? Oh, yes, Sister Joy, please do. Well, you know, I always like to tell stories, Jack, especially those that relate to the Bible. Well, why don't we just imagine that we're living back in the days of Jesus. Now, imagine what it might have been like to have been among the people who observed him at his work and who were required to make a decision as to how they were going to view him and his ministry.
Aeneas, my father, I did not expect to find you so quickly. They told us in name that you might be here in the city gate. Oh, please excuse me, sir. I'm sure you must not recognize me. It's been a long time. I'm Justin Ben Alpheus. Justin? The son of Alpheus? I took you for a Roman. You, you have the appearance. Has your father, Alpheus, become Romanized too? Don't let my clothing deceive you, sir. It is true, my father has acquired Roman citizenship since we moved to Rome some years ago. It was through the favor of Pyrrhus, a Roman senator, who befriended my father. But it is strange to see the son of Alpheus so... So much like a foreigner. I hope to convince you soon that I am truly a son of our father Abraham, observing all the law of Moses, though not, I must admit, a Pharisee, as you and my father Alpheus are. But please excuse me, sir. This is Joanna, my wife. Are you too Roman? No, my lord. I'm second daughter of Andronicus, of the tribe of Benjamin. I was born in Rome, but my father has thoroughly taught us the law of Moses. It is good, my daughter. This is uh, Menion, a faithful scribe in Israel. Welcome to Israel, Dustin. And you too, Joanna. We're pleased, May sir. you have peace. But tell me, sir, where is Crispus? I long to see him. It's been many years since we played together as boys in Capernaum. He has gone out of name for just a while. He has accompanied a funeral procession to the tomb southeast of the city, and he should be returning soon. But uh, why have you returned to the land of your father's people, Justin? Well, my father has prospered in business since we went to Rome. The God of Israel has blessed him. But now conditions there have developed that indicate it's time to extend his interests among our own people. He asked me to find you and seek your advice on certain matters relating to this business. Mm. I'm certain there will be a prosperous venture for you, sir. Mm. And I hope also that I might interest Crispus in joining me. Is he well? Is he any stronger than he was when he was a boy? He's well. He came to name because a friend of his was ill. But when he arrived, the young man had already died. His mother is a widow. He was her only child. What a pity. It must have grieved Crispus. He's such a loving young man. Justin told me how much he's loved Crispus. What a pity that he's been lame in both feet since he was dropped by his nurse as a child. But tell me, sir, is he, is he able to walk much, or has his infirmity worsened over the years? I'm sure Crispus will have much to say about that himself. Ah! <laughs> but it will not be to your liking, will it, Aeneas? Oh, be quiet, Trefosa. Have you no respect for an older man, Israel? <laughs> older man, indeed. Oh. Why is it, then, that he does not rejoice to see his own son recovered from oh, his really? ailment? Did she say recovered, Justin? What do you mean, old woman? Uh, ask Aeneas if he's willing to admit what his own eyes cannot deny. I'll be off with you, old woman. If it were not for your age... I'd report you to the elders of Nate. Oh, no, no, what no. does the old woman mean? Never mind, my son. She's an old woman. Though her age should have taught her more wisdom than she displayed. You'll see. You'll find out, young man. <laughs> Older men, indeed. Even my old eyes can see farther than his. <laughs> Pay no attention to her. Pay no attention to her. Trifosa is a doting old fool. He's been deceived by the gossip of others as gullible as she. Have you not heard of the Nazarene? The Nazarene? And who is he? It's of no consequence. You must have recently arrived. It's true, sir. We came straight to your home from Caesarea where our ship docked. But they told us that you'd come to name. We've talked little with anyone. And I certainly have heard of no Nazarene. Never mind that now. But, uh, tell me. According to the reports we have received from Rome, it would not seem to be the most favorable time for business expansion. It's true, sir, that the bankers are having difficulty getting money. Yes, I know, I know. But ever since Emperor Tiberius lowered the rate of import duty and export taxes to only 1%, we merchants have prospered, especially on imports of spices, silk, linen, glass, and such like from the East. I see. The result mm -hmm. has been, though, that much of our money has gone East to purchase these goods, and little of it is coming back, so that a dangerous scarcity is developing in Rome. Ah, uh -huh. 
The bankers are pleading with Tiberius to release more money from the imperial treasury, but he continues adamant in his own economic program. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. my father and a few of his associates plan to establish connections here in Judea in an effort to interrupt the constant flow of money in the one direction. Mm. I would hear more of this proposal of yours. But aren't you rather young to be entrusted with such great financial responsibility? My father has honored me not only with full partnership in his business, but he's given me his seal ring and granted me Roman citizenship as well. I see, but uh, the, the less we say about uh, Roman affiliations, the better it will be, especially among my associates here in Galilee and Judea. Not that it need affect our relationship in the purely business way, of course. As you say, sir. But, uh... Where do you expect to settle down, my son? I'd hope to stay in your city for a few days, and if you look with favor upon our proposal, to draw up certain contracts which I could take to Jerusalem. A son of Aphius will be welcome in my house. You will stay with us as long as it pleases you. That is most generous of you, sir. However, I would caution you again that our people, even here in Galilee are not as liberal in their views as it would seem that those throughout the dispersion have become, especially as regards the... Father, another miracle. This time you must believe. He's alive. He's alive. He no longer sleeps. I saw it happen with my own eyes. Crispus, what are you saying? Crispus, look at you. You're leaping like Justin. a young one of the stags upon the mountain. My brother, Justin, why are you here? I thought you were in Rome. Oh, how good it is to see you. Oh, you too. You look wonderful. But Christus, Christus, you're as sound as I am. Your, your feet, what's happened? Oh, it's a miracle, my brother. I've been made whole. Then you miracle. have recovered. Well, what is this you're saying of your companion? Was he not just now being carried to the tombs? Yes, he you say, my father. But he's been made alive. Oh, the Nazarene. Even so, it was Jesus of Nazareth. Look, Aeneas. Here comes the widow now. And her son is with her. He comes. Look! He is walking and jumping about. What is all this shouting? Stop this babbling. What is it that has occurred? Oh, my Lord. A great prophet has been raised up among us. Yes. Yes. No. Yes. Prophet. Yes. Great prophet is up in Israel. Yes. Is this not the young man who was carried out for dead? It is indeed, sir. Yes. Yes. My son was dead. And as you know, I am a widow. We were, we were just a short ways out of the city when we saw. And look, here came the Lord with his disciples and a great crowd traveling with and him. And he approached us. And he stopped. Yes. Then he looked upon the mother of my companion, and he said to her, Stop weeping. And he touched the beer. Then he approached, and he touched the beer, and the bear stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, get up. And my dead son sat up. And he was delivered into my hand. Look, here I am. You see me standing here before you. Oh, oh it was a miracle. Has anything like this ever happened before in this room? What a day to rejoice. Isn't it a miracle? What a miracle. What do you make of it, Aeneas? It's strange. Very strange indeed. But it cannot be. Crispus, you are certain that the young man was dead? Of course, Manian. He was already laid upon the bier when I arrived at his mother's house. He was dead. But now, by the grace of God, he lives again. And can you not see it? Have not our own eyes beheld it? Justin, you saw him. Was he not alive? He was indeed alive. If, as you say, he was dead, it is most remarkable. I would like to talk to this. This Jesus of Nazareth. Simon, too, would see him. I know. He has kept asking him to dine with him. Now, if this Jesus accepts, I must arrange with Simon to be there. And I, too. Crispus, I will leave you with Justin. I'm going to the house of Mannion, and I'll wait you there. Uh, it is well, Father. Uh, we will be coming at once. Oh, Justin, isn't it the most marvelous thing that you've ever seen or heard? Think of it. 
Crispus has been made whole again, and now his companion has been brought to life from the dead, raised to life. It is difficult to believe, though I have seen it. Could even the Messiah do more? Well spoken, Justin. That's what many of us are beginning to say. But your father, he seemed very disturbed by the entire affair. My father is very reluctant to accept even my own miraculous recovery as being from God. But, but why? I continue to hope... Aeneas that... is an older man in Israel, Joanna. He must be sure. He has great responsibility. But how could anything be made more clear? Crispus, you have seen the Nazarene and heard him speak. How do you view him? All my doubts have been removed. I know he is a prophet of God. But what of you, Justin? Can you too not believe in view of what you've just witnessed? I don't know. I keep thinking, how would my father view the matter? What would he do? I must reserve my judgment until another time. But come, Crispus. Your father will be waiting for us. <laughs> Justin, how can your doubts remain? Hasn't Crispus recounted many of the marvelous things that the Lord has done in just a little over a year and a half, and how the people flock to hear him and to be healed of their many infirmities? It's true, Joanna. The common people come to him to be healed. But would they be so quick to follow him if they didn't receive good from him? I believe, and I haven't been healed yet. Tell us about it, Crispus. Very well. Shall I begin at the beginning? Please do. I would very much like to hear how you came to put faith in it. Well, it goes back a ways. The second Passover ago, as it was our custom, my father's and mine, we went to Jerusalem to celebrate the festival. The trip from Galilee was always difficult for me, but the father had provided a female ass for me to ride, and I wouldn't miss the festival for anything. Besides... My father always remained over some days after the festival of unfermented cakes to care for business matters. So I further enjoyed my days in Jerusalem. Anyway, this time when we arrived, my father's associates among the Pharisees were in a rage. Well, what had happened? They told my father that a Jesus of Nazareth had made a whip of ropes and had gone into the temple and had driven all those selling the sheep and the cattle out of the temple. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he said to those selling the doves, Take these things away from here. Stop making the house of my father a house of merchandise. Does it surprise you that the Pharisees were in a rage? You haven't yet visited the temple at festival time. The Lord judged them rightly when he said they were making the temple a house of merchandise. But my understanding is they simply sell animals for sacrifice which those traveling long distances can't bring with them. And those with foreign coins must have them exchanged. That's true. But those doing the selling or exchanging of the money charge much more than it's worth, burdening the poor people beyond what God intended, robbing God. Was your father disturbed by what the Lord did? Uh, he has business associations with some of these men. Oh. But then I heard that Jesus' disciples and others who'd witnessed his forthright action were applying to him David's psalm, which says, For sheer zeal for your house has eaten me up. How aptly it fits. But then I got to remembering what the next line of the psalm says. What's that? It says, And the very reproaches of those reproaching you have fallen upon me. 
those reproaching Jesus then were reproaching God. I think it was realizing this that caused me to start putting faith in Jesus. Is that when you were healed? No. Jesus had only been preaching for about six months, and mm. so I had no way of knowing that he could cure me. I see. Then, on our way home from the festival, we passed through the city of Sychar in Samaria, and I learned that Jesus had spent two days there preaching. But no Jew has dealings with Samaritans. No, but Jesus was resting by Jacob's fountain outside the city in the field Jacob had given to Joseph, his son. It was about noon. And his disciples had gone into the city to buy foodstuffs. Hmm. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, despite being a Jew, ask me for a drink when I'm a Samaritan woman? Mm -hmm. In answer, Jesus said to her, If you had known the free gift of God, and who it is that says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Living water? She said to him, Sir, you have not even a bucket for drawing water, and the well is deep. From what source, therefore, do you have this living water? You are not greater than our forefather Jacob, who gave us the well, and who himself, together with his sons and his cattle, drank out of it, are you? In answer, Jesus said to her, Everyone drinking from this water will get thirsty again. Whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty at all. But the water that I will give him will become in him a fountain of water, bubbling up to impart everlasting life. Strange saying. Well, the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may neither thirst nor keep coming over to this place to draw water. Well, when Jesus began to tell her all the things she did, she began to perceive that he was a prophet. Oh, he must be a prophet. So leaving her water jar, she went off into the city and told the men, Come here, see a man that told me all the things I did. This is not perhaps the Christ, is it? And they went out of the city and began coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples who had returned were urging him to eat. But he said to them, My food is for me to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. And many of the city put faith in him. Hmm. So they put faith in him, yet he performed no healings there either. It is true, Joanna. He came on into Galilee and began announcing, The kingdom of the heavens is drawn near. Then, in Cana, an attendant of the king came to him and began asking him to cure his son who was dying in Capernaum. In Capernaum? Cure him all the way from Cana? Yes. What faith he must have had. As you say, Joanna. For when Jesus replied to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. The man entreated him. And Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your son lives. And in that very hour, the boy's fever left him. And he was recovered. What power Jesus must have. And the king's attendant and his whole family believed. Finally, after visiting his own hometown of Nazareth, where he was rejected. Rejected? Yes. He came into Capernaum and chose as disciples Simon and Andrew and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John, and cured many that were ill with various sicknesses, and he expelled many demons. It was here, too, that I was healed of my infirmity. What a blessing. Well, to Jehovah goes the praise. But Jesus didn't stay long in Capernaum. He went into the village towns nearby, preaching in their synagogues throughout the whole of Galilee. And his four disciples were with him. How could anyone not believe in him? But remember, Joanna, Crispus has also told us that the man Jesus eats with sinners and tax collectors. And he works on the Sabbath. Good works, yes. He heals people. But could this man be a prophet if he doesn't keep the Sabbath? Crispus, how do you view the matter? My brother, I can only relate to you what the Lord himself is said and done. He interrupted his tour of Galilee to attend the Passover in Jerusalem. And then, on his way back to Galilee, his disciples were accused by the Pharisees for plucking the heads of grain as they were proceeding through the grain fields on the Sabbath. After reasoning with the Pharisees, Jesus went on to say to them, The Sabbath came into existence for the sake of man, and not man for the Sabbath. But doesn't that Please, seem... Please, excuse me, Justin. 
But he returned to Galilee, and not too far from here, he went into the synagogue, and look, a man with a withered hand. So the people asked him, Is it lawful to cure on the Sabbath? They said this, that they might get an accusation against him. He said to them, Who will be the man among you that has one sheep, and if this falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not get hold of it and lift it out? Hmm. All considered, of how much more worth is a man than a sheep? Of course. So it is lawful to do a fine thing on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, Get up and stand in the center. And he rose and took his stand. And then Jesus said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and it was restored. Sound like the other hand. How can you deny his argument, Justin? Especially since we've just a few days ago seen the widow's son brought to life. How was the restoring of the man's hand received by the leaders of the synagogue? The scribes and the Pharisees, as in Jerusalem at the temple, became filled with madness. And they begin to talk over with one another what they might do to Jesus. You see, Joanna, Crispus, have any of the leaders believed on him? The scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the party followers of Herod, all take issue with but him. But has it not always been thus with the prophets? Who was it that listened to Jeremiah and Isaiah? Even Elijah had to flee for his life from Jezebel. A pagan and a woman. It's all right, Joanna. Don't urge him. Though he's heard much, he's seen but little. The ministry of our Lord has only begun, I'm sure, though nearly two years have passed. But he continues to increase his activity. And as it is... Ah, there you are, Crispus. Yeah. I must see you. <laughs> I must prepare you for the worst. Aeneas, your father, is not a happy man tonight. What and all did not go well at the Feast of Simon? Many who were present there were rejoicing. But there were those of us who were sitting around the wall, observing. But Simon and your father Aeneas and the rest of the Pharisees were not smiling. Oh, Mr. Trifoso, what happened? <laughs> I thought you'd be interested. I wouldn't have missed it for anything. Well, there we were. Simon and your father and all the rest of the Pharisees of importance in the vicinity were there, reclining at the table. Yes. And also, the Nazarene was there, and he was reclining at the table, too. Yes. The rest of us were all sitting around the wall observing as usual. Then, who should come in but a woman who is well known in the city to be a Sinner. Sinner? Not a woman you'd have any dealings with, my dear. <laughs> a notorious sinner. Anyway, she learned that the Nazarene was reclining at a meal at the house of Simon, and she brought an alabaster case of perfumed oil. And taking a position behind his feet, she wept and started to wet his feet with her tears. And she would wipe them off with the hair of her head. Also, she tenderly kissed his feet and greased them with the perfume oil. The Pharisees were looking at one another as though to say, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what kind of a woman it is that is touching him, that she is a sinner. But then the Nazarene said to his host, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he said, Teacher, say it. Then the Nazarene went on to tell this riddle. What was it, Professor? Tell us. Two men were debtors to a certain lender. The one was in debt for 500 denarii, but the other for 50. When they did not have anything with which to pay back, he freely forgave them both. Mm. Therefore, which of them will love him the more? How remarkable. Well, all of us who were observing looked at each other and nodded, because we knew the point of his mm -hmm. question, too. Anyway, in answer, Simon said, I suppose it is the one to whom he freely forgave the more. Mm -hmm. And the Nazarene said to him, 
You judged correctly. With that, he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you behold this woman? I entered into your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But this woman wet my feet with her tears and wiped them off with her hair. You gave me no kiss. But this woman, from the hour that I came in, did not leave off tenderly kissing my feet. Mm. You did not grease my head with oil, but this woman greased my feet with perfumed oil. Remarkable. By virtue of this, I tell you, her sins, many though they are, are forgiven because she loved much. But he who's forgiven little loves little. Then he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. Forgiving her sins? We all marveled at the saying. But those reclining at the table with him looked at each other as though to say, Who is this man who even forgives sins? But he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go your way in peace. How remarkable! How she must have rejoiced! Ah, yes, my dear. So did we all. But did the Pharisees get the point? Not one Pharisee in that house would change his view of her. But the rest of us crowded around her and escorted her out of the house, rejoicing with her in her repentance of her bad deeds. Did my father, too, fail to get the point of his saying? You are a good boy, Crispus. But Aeneas, your father. I cannot agree with my father in these matters, but the law in Israel says you must honor your father. It is your bed. Not of your own making, it's true. But you must lie in it. As for me, besides... I see Aeneas coming now. I have no words for him. He is not my father, and I thank God he is not my son. (laughs) Welcome back, father. May God look upon you with favor. May he smile upon you too, my son. Did all uh, go well at the feast, sir? All was well. Your Nazarene was there. I know, Father. You told me when you left that he'd been invited, and and you went because you wanted to see him and and talk with him. Did any man ever speak like this man? He spoke most disrespectfully to his host, Simon. Simon is a good man, and he's known throughout all of this country for his deeds of charity. He feeds the poor. He attends to the sick. Everybody knows of this. He gives his tithes regularly to the temple. And yet this, this Jesus charged him in his own house with being a man lacking in love. How can this man be a prophet? Tell me. A woman, notorious for her sins in the city, came in and took a position behind him. She fawned upon him, lavishing costly perfumed oil upon him, rubbing it upon his feet and wiping his feet with her hair. Ah... If he were a prophet, would he not have known that she was a sinner? Would he have allowed her to touch him in this way? You mean he didn't know that she was a sinner? I ask, would he have allowed her to touch him in this way if he had? But did he not say... It's all right, Joanna. Well, this man would make us believe that he can even forgive sins. How do you mean, sir? Well, he said to this vile woman, your sins are forgiven. But I thought you said... How then did he come to know that she was a sinner? It must be that in her crying over his feet, she must have pleaded with him to forgive her. How else would he know? I see. Now I am fatigued, Crispus. We will spend one more night with Mannion. Then tomorrow, we'll set out on our return journey home. It is well, Father. Crispus, I don't understand. It's all right, Joanna. Perhaps she did plead with the Nazarene for forgiveness. Could this not account for his knowing and for what he said? Oh, my brother, 
A man can see things only in the way he views them with his eyes. And my father's eyes are not looking for the Messiah unless he comes according to the pattern my father himself has fashioned for him. I can only pray to God that the veil is not drawn too tightly over his face. But Crispus, my brother, is it such a vital thing that we settle the matter one way or another right now? You believe that the Nazarene is a prophet, and it appears that your father does not. But need that cause you to be set one against the other? Can you the not... The matter is not so simply resolved as that, my brother. If, as I believe, Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, can I turn my back on him and remain guiltless before God? And if my father, in refusing to accept him, actually opposes him, is he not, in fact, opposing the true God? How can I continue? But did you not yourself say just a moment ago that the law of Moses tells us you must honor your father and your mother? How then... My heart is torn by that realization. But the law of Moses also says of the true God, you must not have any other gods against my face. And it teaches us to do the will of our God. But the will of my father, Aeneas, is not the will of my father, the God of Israel. Whom shall I honor first? I see. What is it then that you intend to do? My mind is made up. I can't return to my father's house tomorrow. I've learned that Jesus intends to make a second tour of Galilee with the twelve whom he's specially chosen. I am determined to follow him. Then you must go, Crispus, and may the God of Israel go with you. And what of us, Justin? I've made a covenant with my father, Alphaeus. He's depending on me to fulfill it. Whether our venture will succeed or not depends on how I'm received in Jerusalem. And that depends in large measure on whether Aeneas and his associates are agreeable to my proposals. And to me. In the few days we've been here, I have made real progress. I cannot jeopardize that. Your progress with Aeneas is only to the extent of his interest in your business proposals. Please excuse me, Christmas, but it's quite clear how your father views anyone who's not strictly a Pharisee. He refuses to accept the miraculous works of Jesus, who is a man of humble origin, but he'll do business with you, Justin, in spite of the way he resents your Roman background, but only because he stands to gain by it financially. It's all right, Joanna. I can see how it is. I had hoped, Crispus, my brother, that you would be working by my side, but I cannot deny you the choice you've made. As for me, my decision was made in Rome. I have no choice but to see it through. Crispus, it's so good to see you. And you, Justin, and Joanna. May you have peace. It's been so long. Over a year has passed. I missed you at the Passover, so I'd hoped to see you here in Jerusalem during the Festival of Booths. But though I looked, there were so many I people. I know, Justin. And that's why I sent for you to meet me here in the square near the temple. It would seem that you've been doing well. Have your efforts borne fruit? We've been blessed greatly. This past year has brought us much closer to our goal than I had thought possible. A few more months, and I'm sure we'll have everything settled completely. I'm so glad for you. But we've been hearing many things, Crispus. Jesus' enemies are increasing in numbers, and their anger against him is mounting steadily. Your father and others of the Pharisees have come away smarting from the stinging rebukes they've received. And I fear for your safety. Do not fear for me, Justin. But do you know why they're being rebuked? 
Because they don't recognize Jesus as a prophet. It's more than that. Let me show you what I mean. A short time after we parted in Nain, and Jesus began his second tour of Galilee, the people brought him a demon-possessed man, blind and dumb. And he cured him so that the dumb man spoke and saw. Well, all the crowds were simply carried away. But the Pharisees said, This fellow does not expel the demons except by means of Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. But that's denying the power of God. Exactly, Joanna. So Jesus said, Every sort of sin and blasphemy will be forgiven, men. But the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Then, as an answer to him, some of the scribes and Pharisees said, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. In reply, he said to them, I know. His answer was related to me. He called them a wicked and adulterous generation that keeps on seeking for a sign. But he said no sign would be given it except the sign of Jonah, the prophet. What did he mean by that, Crispus? He said, as it was told to us, that just as Jonah was in the belly of the huge fish three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. What could that mean? How is that possible? We don't know. We've been pondering it, but Jesus says nothing further to explain it. We await the sign's appearance with keen anticipation. What is the man seeking to accomplish, Crispus? Is he working to get a following? No, because many that he cures who show faith in him, he sends back to their homes, instructing them not to mention it to anyone, like Jairus, the presiding officer of the synagogue. After Jesus raised Jairus' little 12-year-old daughter from the dead, he ordered them again and again to let no one learn of this. But did you know that just before this last Passover, there were some who wanted to seize him and make him king? That could prove dangerous if it were to get to the ears of Tiberius Caesar. I know. But Jesus turned away from them and withdrew into the mountains all alone. It was during his third tour of Galilee that this attempt was made. And after he'd expanded his preaching still more by sending out the twelve ahead of him two by two, it was right after John the Baptist was beheaded and Jesus fed 5,000 men with but five loaves and two fishes. But he does continue to preach the kingdom of God has drawn near. I know for a certainty that many of the Pharisees are fearful what the Romans will do to the nation because of him. And I fear for Jesus' life. If you could hear some of the threats. I know. Just now, during the festival, someone had to lay hands on him, and the chief priests and Pharisees dispatched officers to get hold of him. Hmm. But after hearing him speak, they returned to the Pharisees empty-handed and told them, Never has another man spoken like this. But now Jesus has completed his third tour of Galilee, traveling from one end of the land to the other, from Phoenicia near the sea to the Decapolis, east of Jordan, and from Mount Hermon down through Samaria here into Judea. When he would withdraw in an effort to find rest, for he doesn't even have time to eat, the crowds find out about it and thoughtlessly seek him out. But never does he become angry or scold them. Rather, he takes pity on them, a sheep without a shepherd, skinned and knocked about. And now, after three years of intensive preaching, he only increases his activity. We know he intends to carry his ministry throughout Judea, sending out ahead of him this time 70 others by twos, and then throughout Perea, east of the Jordan, before returning to Jerusalem next Passover. How anyone could do more, it's difficult to imagine. And yet, in spite of it, hatred against him continues to increase. Because of it. And now that hatred is being manifested against anyone who looks with favor on his works. Why, it has been reported to us. We've heard those of Justin's friends threatening. Associates, Joanna. I seek no friendship with those who... See, this one, he was blind and now he sees. This is the man who used to sit and beg, is it not? This is he. Not at all, but he's like him. Are you the one? I am he. How then were your eyes open? Tell us, we want to know. The man called Jesus spit on the ground and made a clay with his saliva and smeared it on my eyes and said to me, Go to Salaam and wash. I therefore went and washed and gained sight. I can see. Where is this man? I do not know. Here, let us take him to the Pharisees. The Pharisees will decide the matter. Let's hear what the Pharisees say about this man.
This man says he was blind, and now he sees. How is this possible? It was the man called Jesus who restored my sight. And how did he do this? He put clay upon my eyes, and I washed and had sight. And uh, when did this happen? Today. It, it happened just now. But this is the Sabbath. Oh. This is not a man from God because he does not observe the Sabbath. It is as it has always been. He violates the Sabbath. He consorts with sinners. And he makes himself to be God. He's but an how, imposter. But how is it that this man as a sinner can perform signs of this sort? You do not know the man. You do not know him. How do we know that this beggar has truly received his sight again? What do you say about him? Seeing that he opened your eyes. He's a prophet. We cannot believe that you have been blind and have gained sight until we have heard testimony that you were blind. Bring your parents that we may question them. Yes. The Pharisees would speak with you. How can we talk to them? What can we say? Have not the Jews already come to an agreement? That if anyone confesses Jesus as the Christ, he should get expelled from the synagogue. How then can we stand before them and testify that our son was healed by Jesus? You need admit nothing. All you need to do is testify that this is your son and he was born blind. Let the Pharisees decide what they will in the matter. Come now, present yourselves before them. Let's go. Make room here, please. Let us through. Hey, See now, here are the man's parents. Ask them if this is not their son. Do you have a son? We do. And was this son blind from his birth? He was. Is this your son who you say was born blind? This is he. That's the one. How then is it that he sees at present? We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But how it is that he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. Ask him. He's of age. He, he must speak for himself. Give glory to God. We know that the man Jesus is a sinner. And he associates with sinners. And tax collectors. Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that whereas I was blind, I see at present. What did he do for you? How did he open your eyes? I, I told you already, and yet you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You do not want to become his disciples also, do you? What? Mind how you speak to the older men. <sighs> Would you speak thus to us? You come to us claiming that you have regained sight. We simply asked you how it was possible. And you speak to us in this fashion. <laughs> you are a disciple of that man. But we are disciples of Moses. 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 We know that God had spoken to Moses. But as for this man, we do not know where he is from. He's no prophet. This certainly is a marvel that you do not know where he is from. And yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. But if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he listens to this one. From of old, it, it's never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of one born blind. He's from Bill's above. Oh, if this man were not Demon. from God, he could do nothing at all. Oh. Demon. Oh. Demon. You were altogether born in sin, and yet you are teaching us? Be gone! Out with you! Out with you! Strike his name from the road! Let his name no longer be numbered among those attending the synagogue. Strike his name from the road! Outcast you!
What a cruel and heartless thing to do. Crispus, where will this all end? I don't know. Such hatred can only destroy the one who is conquered by it. My father has willfully made himself blinder than the man born without sight. Justin, can you still support such men? How can you continue even to associate with them when they deny the very power of God operating in the man Jesus? You see what happens to the man who puts faith in Jesus. But has he lost more than he's gained? Jesus has the way of everlasting life. He once said to his disciples, If anyone wants to come after me, let him disown himself and pick up his torture stake and continually follow me. For whoever wants to save his soul will lose it. But whoever loses his soul for my sake will find it. For what benefit will it be to a man if he gains the whole world but forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is destined to come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will recompense each one according to his behavior. What will you give in exchange for your soul, my brother? There is no other way. There is no other way. time in coming. For over three years now, the Nazarene has been preaching his inflammatory message up and down the Inflammatory? Healing the sick? Opening the eyes of the blind? Even raising the dead? The power of Beelzebub. Could a man who breaks the Sabbath be a prophet of God? Or makes himself equal to God? Blasphemy! He calls God his father, yet eats with sinners. He's a friend of tax collectors. Does the well man need a physician? How could he save sinners if he only preached among the righteous? Are you, too, one of his disciples? Look! This man, too, would bring uh, salvation. Where is the Messiah? Oh, look, look I, I'm blind. Have mercy on me, Master. Save, O oh, son of David. Go on. Heal him. If you can. Con, I'm no disciple of that one. You talk like one. Did they not also cast out demons? Go on, cast out his demons. <laughs> oh, Justin, I'm frightened. How could they be so heartless? Ignore them. They'll not bother us. They're not responsible for what they're doing. The whole city is in a frenzy today. Ever since Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, the scribes and Pharisees have been more determined to kill him. And since he rode into Jerusalem five days ago when the crowds began hailing him as king. And then went into the temple and drove out the money changers and those selling animals for sacrifices. Crispus is certain something tragic is due to happen soon. I know. He said how the Lord told his disciples on several occasions that he'd be put to death. But Justin, today's the Passover. They wouldn't do anything like that today, would they? How could they put to death this one who's been so loving and kind to the crowds who've come to him for help? If the rest of the city is of the same temper as this crowd, they can, and they will. If they don't fear to throw a man out of the synagogue who believes in him, they don't fear the power that enables Jesus to do his marvelous works. I know they plan to kill Jesus. I've heard them talking about it. But they fear the people. What will happen, we must wait and see. Crispus said he'd meet us here. 
rabbi, yet he will not allow the people to lay off for those he's right. By what authority does he think he performs his works? And who gave him this authority? Would you dare to put that question to him yourself? Tell him, Gaius, what happened just three days ago. Very well. That same question was put to Jesus by the chief priest and the older men while he was teaching in the temple just three days ago. In reply, Jesus said to them, I also will ask you one thing. If you tell it to me, I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism by John, from what source was it? From heaven or from men? And what did they answer him? They began to reason among themselves, saying, If we say, from heaven, he will say to us, Why then did you not believe him? <laughs> if though we say, from men, we have the crowd to fear, for they all hold John as a prophet. So in answer to Jesus, they said, We do not know. <laughs> <laughs> what did he answer? Tell him, Gaius. He in turn said to them, Neither am I telling you by what authority I do these things. <laughs> you need not laugh at us. You Herodians fared no better with your questions. Tell us, Nicolaus, what happened? <laughs> Some of the party followers of Herod went to him to catch him in his speech. On arrival, they said to him, Teacher, we know you are truthful and you do not care for anybody. For you do not look upon men's outward appearance, but you teach the way of God in line with truth. Those hypocrites. Quiet. Is it lawful to pay head tax to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? How did he answer? He said to them, Why do you put me to the test? Bring me a denarius to look at. They brought one. Here, let me show you. Give me a coin. And he held it out to them like this. And he said, Whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Jesus then said, Pay back Caesar's things to Caesar, but God's things to God. Pharisee. It was the Pharisees who tricked some of the Herodians into asking that question. You would always try to hide behind someone else while appearing so righteous. The Nazarene pictured you well that same day when he said, You want to walk around in robes and watch readings in the marketplaces, in front seats in the synagogues, and most prominent places at evening meals? You are the ones devouring the houses of widows and for a pretext make long prayers. You are the ones, he said, who will receive a heavier judgment. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Hear me! Hear this! The Nazarene has been taken before Pilate. Uh, He's even now in the governor's palace, and the chief priests and older men stand outside accusing him. Of what? Of making himself king of the Jews! Oh, Justin, how could they? How could they? Oh, Justin, it is finished. They have murdered our Lord. They have hanged him on a stake like a sinner, cursed of God, the one who committed no sin, the one in whose mouth no deception was found, who expended himself right down to the last in the service of others, who was eaten up by his zeal for God's house, who brought only comfort and hope to a diseased and dying world. Is there no limit to the shame they will bring on Israel? May his blood be upon their heads and the heads of their children to time indefinite. Be at peace, my brother. They have murdered the chief agent of life, but they can never destroy what he has accomplished in the short three and a half years of his ministry. For the way of life that he held out has been sounded down deeply into the hearts of men. And it will continue to uphold them and enrich them with a heritage that no man can take away.
Oh, Crispus, I can hardly believe the events of this day. These are thrilling times in which we live. So many things have happened. Yes, it's difficult to realize that it's been only 50 days plus two since the chief agent of life was done away with and fastened to a stake by lawless men. How he grieved for him. But now we know what Jesus meant when he gave the scribes and Pharisees a sign, the sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah was in the belly of the huge fish for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. Yes, and David, because he was a prophet, saw beforehand and spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ on the third day, that neither was he forsaken in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. What a time of rejoicing it was when we learned that God had resurrected him by loosing the pangs of death. Yes, because it was not possible for him to continue to be held fast by it. It's so marvelous. It's no wonder even the apostles had difficulty believing it at first. But not for long. That very day, he appeared to Cleopas and another of his disciples as they were journeying to Emmaus. Although, at first, their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And as he walked along the road with them, he interpreted many things pertaining to himself in all the scriptures. Finally, when they reached the home of the disciples, he was persuaded to recline with them at a meal. And then, as he took the loaf, blessed it, broke it, and, and began to hand it to them, their eyes were fully opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from them. Well, they said, were not our hearts burning as he was speaking to us on the road? And that very hour, they started back the seven miles to Jerusalem to report to the apostles and those assembled with them what had happened. Wasn't that one of the times Jesus appeared to the apostles? Yes, although they became so frightened, they were imagining they beheld a spirit. Not until he ate a piece of broiled fish were they relieved. And it was at that time that he foretold what has just occurred today, the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit on the 120 disciples and all speaking with different tongues, just as the Spirit was granting them to make utterance. We heard about it, and that's when we came together with all those others, marveling, about 3,000 persons. And Peter explained to us thoroughly what was taking place. Yes. That has become the turning point in our lives, Justin's and mine. Oh, I hope Justin doesn't delay much longer. I can't bear to be separated from him for a moment today. Did he say where he was going? No, only that he had an urgent errand to perform. But look, here he comes now. It's so good to see you today, my brother. And Joanna has just related to me how you were both among the 3,000 that came together to inquire what was happening when God's Spirit was poured out on the 120 disciples. And what a revelation it was when Peter began to address the crowd. What an inspiring talk that was. Oh, yes. After telling how Jesus had been put to death by lawless men, he said, This Jesus, God resurrected, of which fact we are all witnesses. Mm -hmm. Therefore, because he was exalted to the right hand of God and received the promised Holy Spirit from the Father, he has poured out this which you see and hear. Yes. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for a certainty that God made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you impaled. Mm -hmm. How we were stabbed to the heart by those words. And we asked, what shall we do? Then Peter said, repent, and let each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the free gift of the Holy Spirit. And, oh, Justin, when he exhorted us, saying, get saved from this crooked generation, and you added your amen, my heart leaped for sheer joy. Mm. And then, Crispus, we were both baptized, along with the 3,000. Oh, there are no words for the joy that is in my heart today. But tell me, Justin, where did you go off to in such a hurry after we were baptized? I went to our house to fetch something, to fulfill a debt that is mine. Here. I have here in this pouch, in money and in precious gems, all the value that has come to be my portion from my father's business since the festival of the Passover, the day our Lord died. We don't need it for ourselves, and I don't want it anymore. But there are many here in Jerusalem from every nation under heaven who've become disciples today. 
Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the inhabitants of Mesopotamia and the district of Asia, and even from Egypt and the parts of Libya. And I recognized many from Rome. Also Cretans and Arabians. And all of these would prolong their stay in Jerusalem to become more fully acquainted with the good news if only they had the means to sustain them here. So, Crispus, would you take this money to the apostles and deposit it at their feet that it may be distributed to anyone just as you might have the need? Oh, Justin, how thoughtful and generous. But why don't you give it yourself, Justin? I would rather you did it. It matters little who gives it just so our brothers will not be in need. As you say, my brother. Another thing, Joanna. Yes? A few days ago, I arranged to sell our house here in Jerusalem and the piece of land we have out toward Bethany. Oh? The deed is to be transferred after the festival, and Crispus, I would like for you to bring the values of these things sold and deposit them also at the feet of the apostles. As you say. Oh, Justin, you know I would have no objection to anything like that. I know. You've always had a most generous spirit. And so do you, my brother. A most generous spirit. Not at all. Here it is that for the past two years, I have been seeking to bolster the shaken economy of the Roman Empire and to find security for myself and my father's house in doing so. And all the while, you have been offering me a treasure that nothing can corrupt or destroy. Now, in this hour of divine victory for our Lord and Savior, I can only pray to God that he will permit me to use everything that I have in his service and to maintain my hold on this most precious gift of life that he's extended to me in his mercy. Oh, Justin. Several months ago, Joanna, I wrote to my father in Rome and asked him to relieve me of my financial obligations to him. You did? What did he reply? I told him why I could no longer have dealings with Aeneas and his associates here in Jerusalem. And I wrote him at length about the powerful works and signs being mm. performed by Jesus of Nazareth. Oh, Justin, what did and he I say? I thought you weren't even interested in him then. Not only has my father agreed to release me, he has very generously offered to buy my interest in his firm. But my greatest joy is this. He has shown a deep interest in what I've written him about Jesus. How May wonderful. May be praised. And has asked me many questions relating to the prophecies concerning the Messiah. Oh. Now that Joanne and I have both been baptized today and have received the free gift of God's Holy Spirit, I want to abandon my own interests completely and share with Joanna in obeying the commandment our Lord gave at the time he ascended into heaven. Go, therefore, and make disciples of people of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things I have commanded you. Oh, Justin, I want to. I want to go back to Rome right away with our brothers from there and join with all these others returning to their own lands to preach this good news in all the inhabited earth. May Jehovah bless you, my brother. And Crispus, my brother, I'd hope that you could share with me in what I thought would be a bright future for us both. Instead, while I'll be separated from you bodily, here I am, joining with you in a future that will see no end. An eternity together, all three of us, in the presence of our Lord. To Jehovah goes the praise. <laughs> vindication of his ministry when 3,000 disciples were added the same day the Christian congregation was formed. Their mourning over Jesus' death was certainly turned into rejoicing. What a heart-rending experience that must have been for Jesus' disciples when they saw him hanging on the stake. Yes, just like the prophecy had foretold, the shepherd was struck and the sheep were scattered. If it hadn't been for the Spirit of God that came upon them, they never could have survived. Aye. But God's Spirit upheld them, 
And after Jesus was resurrected and he began to appear to them and, and uh, encourage them, then they began to realize why all this had to take place. And they began to preach themselves with boldness and fearlessly in the temple. And what an example Jesus had set for them. He must have been on the go constantly. It seems like he never did let up. I can see why you don't slow down. You're really following his example. Well, at least I'm trying, Laura. The scripture says to look intently at the chief agent and perfecter of our faith, Jesus, as a model of one who stuck to his assignment through thick and thin. And Paul says to do this so that you may not get tired and give out in your souls. I never cease thanking Jehovah for opening our eyes and bringing us into the way of life. Sometimes I wonder if we can ever do enough to show our appreciation. That's a fine way to feel, Jack. We should feel that way always, really. I'd been in the truth about a year, and... Lately, we've been asking, what is it we really want from life, from our marriage? You've been in the truth a long time, though, Laura. I remember when you were born. And your parents took such an interest in bringing you up in the discipline and authority of advice of Jehovah. I know, but in the last couple of months... For some reason, at least until a month or so ago, neither of us thought too seriously about pioneering. I think secretly I've been interested in seeing how much I can get out of this old system before it goes down. Like uh, Justin in the story you just told us seemed easier to do that than spend much time going from door to door. Well, I think some who've never really tasted of the full-time service might feel that way, not realizing how much happiness and peace of mind can come from helping uh, honest people to know about Jehovah. That's been my case. I've developed a daily routine, a pattern of life that I've become accustomed to, working, attending the meetings, going from door to door is a customary practice. And I realize now, reflecting on the intensive ministry of Jesus, that I've almost lost contact with the purpose behind it all, feeling reasonably secure in it, as though going through all these motions was fulfilling my responsibility. I felt the same way. I grew up attending meetings and sharing in all the activity of Jehovah's people, and just took for granted that someday I'd get married and have a family and go right on attending meetings and sharing in the field ministry, even subconsciously resisting to some degree anything that would suggest a change in this pattern of life. Yes, well, that can happen to us, Laura. But then I think of Jesus and what he did with his life. Now, he, he'd been a carpenter. He attended the synagogue on the Sabbath. He observed the festivals like all the others in the Jewish community he lived in. But I'm sure that every day of those years he spent growing up, right up until he was 30 years old, every day was spent preparing himself for the great change that was going to take place in his life when he would abandon this entire course up to that time and devote his entire time and attention to fulfilling Jehovah's purpose for him. That's what Jack and I have been considering the last couple of months, that we ought to make Jehovah's service the center of our lives. We really have. And now, after what we've just heard, I'm even more convinced that this is the right thing for us to do. Very fine. You know, it's a difficult decision for me to make. I'd like to have a baby and raise a family. But I think I'm getting more and more convinced that now, for us, this is the best thing we could do. There is no greater pleasure, Laura, than that of Jehovah's service. But I do want to say that there are many who have raised families and still enjoy Jehovah's service. You never had any children, did you, Sister Joy? No, I didn't. Brother Joy and I made the same decision early in life that you're considering now. But many of our friends didn't feel that way about it. And they've had wonderful lives in Jehovah's service, too. I know many of those who became active in the truth when we did have children and grandchildren now. Many of the children are elders in the congregations, and some of the grandchildren are in the missionary work. They feel very well rewarded in seeing their children so active in Jehovah's service. 
Do you ever regret that you didn't have children? No, I never regret it, Laura. Brother Joy and I were so busy in the work of the Lord that we never regretted the decision we made earlier in life, nor do I regret it now, even though Brother Joy is gone. When I go to an assembly now, I always see many there that I've been able to help to learn the truth that to me are just like children, spiritual children anyway. Children, grandchildren, and even great-grandchildren. And I'm so happy with them. Jesus said that we have to decide what is best for us. But whether we're raising a family or not, we can still keep on increasing in our productive work, just like Jesus did. But Jesus knew he had a limited time to preach, didn't he? Yes, he did. He knew when the time to finish his work and to die was to come. And now we know that our remaining time for the preaching is greatly reduced. It can't be much longer. So why shouldn't we work harder now than we've ever worked before? There's certainly every reason for it. You know, Sister Joy, hearing you tell us today about some of the events in the ministry of Jesus with an added little story about Justin and Joanna and Crispus. Reminds me of something in my high school days. What's that, Jack? As a teenager, I was very interested in athletics, especially (laughs) participating in track events. Is that right? I'd been in several races, the 100-yard dash and several hurdle events, and then I began to get interested in the cross-country race. I didn't know that. Well... I didn't know what a grueling event it could be. The ground we had to run on cross-country was very rough, across fields and through streams, and then, at the end, when we thought our lungs would burst, the home stretch was all uphill. But it never even entered our minds to slow down. All we could see was the finish line. And while I felt sometimes in that final stretch like... I was running right up the side of a wall. We kept going. Some of the boys would even fall across the finish line. But that was the race. And that was just a sporting event. With no real purpose or reward. Except to finish. And that urge was very strong. Now with the end of this system so near at hand, I feel, well... I know. Like when Jesus said... My food is for me to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Exactly. With no distractions or letting up. Hold to that resolve, both of you, and the zeal of Jehovah's house will truly eat you up. To be sure, brothers, all of us rejoice to know that 57,446 enjoyed this drama.